if you've had a business for any length of time, you'll realize that tension against you. If you don't actually have a unique market imbalance there, your profits will be zero. They just chase to the grounds because that's what the marketplace wants. They want you to make zero money. That's the most efficient business, solves the problem barely, like just enough to solve the problem. I didn't realize this was a really controversial topic until I started sharing it in rooms where there were aspiring entrepreneurs. And uh, it's counterintuitive, but it has to do with the idea of imperfect action, which um, I, I have to think back early in entrepreneurship. I, someone introduced this idea to me of like imperfect action. As a, as a creator, and, and I don't mean you have to be like creative, but as someone who's a builder, you're a producer, you like to, uh, I mean, I, for me, this is like what I see as entrepreneurship is you, you believe you see a possible better future and you're willing to take personal and professional risks to make that future a reality. That's an act of producing, of creating. You're honestly in the minority of just the, the, the world. Um, but it's a beautiful thing. It's what creates so many amazing solutions. And in that desire to create something, this amazing future, I think a lot of people are paralyzed by their own imperfections, right? People are silenced by their own familiarity with their, with their own genius. I really wanna draw a little bit of a parallel here between imperfect action. I'm gonna make the case for imperfect action, but I wanna give you a practical example of how we have seen this played out to create market imbalance. And so I'm gonna um, unpack this for a second. Primarily, I've, I found this is true. And, and honestly, this concept I first got from a, a great book, Daniel Priestley, I think it's oversubscribed. And he talks about um, you know, the economics of all business is it's supply and demand. And beyond just like you know, business existing, but if you wanna have a profitable business, the marketplace could care less about your profits. Truly, we see this all the time. You go to Amazon and you're like, do I, if there's two things, literally the same thing and one's $20 and one's $10, like we're not fools. We're going to choose the $10 thing unless somehow the reviews uh, for the $10 thing is like, you know, two stars and the, the $20 thing is $10, 10 or you know, five stars. We're making this value consideration, but honestly, we don't care about profits. The marketplace despises profits. And so if you've had a business for any length of time, you'll realize that that tension against you, if you're not strategic, if you don't actually have a unique market imbalance there, your profits will be zero. They just chase to the grounds um, because that's what the marketplace wants. They want you to make zero money. That's like the most efficient business solves the problem barely, like just enough to solve the problem. And, um, and so let me give you some examples of market imbalances. Um, musicians walk the streets of Nashville, or even a lot of times like just any downtown city, and you see people playing all over the place. Tons of musicians. I think in 2023, Taylor Swift broke the record for 2.3 million tickets sold in like a matter of hours. Musicians, completely saturated market. Taylor Swift, breaking records. Do you think Taylor Swift has unreal and kind of unfair profit margins? Of course she does. She's and it's, it's, it's not by accident. Right. And, and you can find this in other ways. Like, you know, the big, big brands use this to their advantage. Look like, like cyber trucks, Tesla. I think they did. It was some insane figure of like $1.6 billion in pre-sales on the cyber truck. Now we'll see if that's to be realized, but that was pre-sales like pre-committed sales, but for something that did not exist. Were there already truck manufacturers? Absolutely. There were right. And, um, and so getting back to it, why they're able to do that, like insane accomplishments of kind of unfair profits. You think about like for Tesla at that point, I don't know exactly what it penned out to be, but for those reservations, that was just, that was just net profit. I actually, I can't recall, but I don't even know if they credit for to the sale. I think that's like the privilege to then buy also because they get to reset the price. So you're like, that was just a, please donate me a hundred dollars for the privilege of someday being able to buy my product. And they did it in incredibly large numbers, right? And, and so you, you wonder, why can these people do it? Why? There's tons of trucks or car or auto manufacturers. They're breaking into this. And that was 2019, I think, is when that was happening. Like recently, Taylor Swift, tons of artists, tons of musicians. Why does she blow it up? And uh, they, they, they play on these two types of market imbalances. I want to draw this back to how you can use imperfect action to create a market imbalance. And um, so for Taylor Swift, the market imbalance is relationships. That's what it is. People feel connected to her uniquely. It's the same power that actors have. Another saturated market, 
tons of actors out there. What different, like the person who's acting in, I don't know, some commercial, are they actually less talented or skilled than another actor who's pulling tens of millions or a hundred millions of dollars a year, you know, to, 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 to do a film or do a show or whatever it is. A lot of times, no, that's not it. They just have manipulated supply and demand based on relationships. They have one of them and there's more people that would want them to be on their show or be in their, you know, uh, be on their movie. And so it, it's just an imbalance of supply and demand. Um, for like a Tesla, there's maybe a little factor there with like Elon, but I actually think it was more of innovation. So innovation is another thing that creates a market imbalance. If you do something totally unique, you know, this is, this is gets into like play bigger. If you create your own category, you have something proprietary and all it takes is supply of one and every, you know, increase in demand means there's an imbalance there. And, um, I think it's helpful. So that's one hopefully foundational thing to understand. The other encouraging thing is it only takes two to create an imbalance. And so that I've seen this played out a number of different times. Um, I think in, in uh, Priestley's book, he talks about the example of uh, Gary V did this. I think I, I actually saw it in real life with uh, uh, Alex Hermosi. I don't know if he's playing on the same concept there, but basically, you know, um, for Gary V, the play was he stood on stage and said, hey, I was doing a fundraiser and he said, I'll, I'll raffle off one hour of my time. And initially, you know, you got people like $200, $300 keeps on going. It gets to where there's like two guys and they're going back $4,000, $45, $5,000, you know, $6,000. And, um, I think they pushed where it's like just two guys, but there was only one offer to buy and they drove it like the rest of the market left at like $2,000 and they both drove it up to like, I think in the $7,000 range. All it takes is two to create an imbalance. If your supply is one, two people want it, you can get crazy high high rates for that limited supply. And I think at the end, to, to Gary V's story, he then, you know, he says, hey, if both of you go like 8,000 bucks, I'll give you both of it. So he, he generates $16,000 for charity. It costs him two hours of his time, but it's a perfect illustration for this imbalance in supply and demand. And so getting back to our original hypothesis here, imperfect action. How can imperfect action help you create a market imbalance because if you're not intentionally creating a market imbalance through, and here's the four that he uh, details out there is there's like innovation, there's relationships, there's convenience, and there's price. Those are really the four that you can uh, manipulate. And price just means if you've got some like special arrangement, this is the example there was, this is like those, I, I think of it in antique shops. You're like, why do antique shops exist? Most of the time it's because they own the real estate. They're not paying rent. And so you're like, how in the world do they exist? It's because this is a hobby business, but they own the real estate. So why can they stay around when like all the other shops are like struggling? Because they actually have a price efficiency. They're not paying rent. And so that, that, that is a unique efficiency of price. And they can pass that savings in a way off to the customer in the sense that they can even offer this product. But you, you see this in other ways too. Actually, you know, Arizona IC, I just saw an interview. Uh, they're not raising their price of uh, Arizona iced tea, they're keeping it at 99 cents. That's their key thing. And someone's interviewing like, why don't you increase your price for profits? And he said, we own, this is key, that's like, they basically have price efficiency. They own all the real estate, they own all the manufacturing, they, they own all their things. And so while everybody else, you go out there, and I'm, I'm gonna make a beverage, you're usually renting all of those things. So if you're renting and the rent increases every single year, what do you have to do? You have to increase your price every single year. That he was like, we carry no debt and we own our entire process of infrastructure. When you do that, you don't have to increase your price because his marginal cost of doing it is literally just the can. And so if it like actually costs him 30 cents to manufacture the can of iced tea, he's like, that's actually our cost because we're not carrying rent. We're not carrying machine leases, any of that stuff, canning process. They've consolidated their, their uh, system so they can compete on price. Most of us can't compete on price. So where is it better to go? Relationships, innovation. And the third one, convenience. Super unique. That's actually largely positioning. And, um, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna talk about prototyping. So the key thing with prototyping to create a imbalance is our most popular version of a prototype is a wait list. <laughs> we literally ask, do you want this? We have not built it. We have not even pursued it at all, but we will generate interest. And then let's say, and this is a practical example for us. We did this. We did, Hey, are you interested in this? 150 people said, I want this. Well, then we decided we're like, we're going to release three. I could, sometimes you think I'm going to go out there and release 150 because 150, 150 people want it. I should go and do this. 
But when you do that and there's a balance of supply and demand, what happens? Your price and your profits drop to zero. So instead, we intentionally said, well, we kind of looked at it too. We, to be fair, you can elevate the level of your service to justify or the, to naturally restrict your supply. But the imperfect action is to generate interest. Then they call this like soft signaling interest. How can you validate demand before you can actually see demand, right? True demand, I know, they pay you money. And it's like, I know there's the there's demand. How many people are waiting in line? Well, actually that, how many people are buying? But it's like, how do you create a waiting in line experience as a digital entrepreneur in your marketing and drive everything to a wait list? So imagine if you're, you start off, you got a new product line and you don't let them buy. You drive interest in the same way and then you say, hey, if you're interested, I think this is what the price is gonna be, you can RSVP over here. Then when you come back to them, here's exactly what we did. We had 150 people on the wait list. Um, we ended up just picking out five. We talked to five. We said we can onboard three. Well, we, we just keep on talking to people. We ended up only talking to five people before we onboard our three people. It was done, right? This is what allowed us to, to launch something brand new, but it was in perfect action because you could put out, people are uncomfortable. I could put out a, do you want it? And then maybe decide I'm not gonna build this. And people are like weirdly uncomfortable with that idea of like, ah, why would I get them interested in something I'm not actually gonna deliver? This is what healthy markets do. They intentionally yep. have a market imbalance, a unique market imbalance in their favor. And that's the only thing that allows you to have any sort of profit. So hopefully some of these stories resonated and uh, were helpful for you in your journey and you start to apply them in your marketing. Um, because truly, I believe, you know, as an entrepreneur out there and you're solving real meaningful problems, you deserve to have profits. Otherwise, you will stop existing. And for me as a consumer, I am frustrated when good businesses, innovative businesses and innovative solutions don't exist. 